author and educator. A psalm of protest sung on the eve of an election before the seats of power. What malice, what cynicism, what blatant manipulation of democracy to perpetrate injustice and pervert the will of the people. Voter suppression, gerrymandering, turning a blind eye to attacks from hostile governments. Woe to the usurpers who gain power falsely. God of retribution, God of retribution appear. Rise up, judge of the earth, repay the arrogant what they deserve. Can a corrupt throne be aligned with you? Can justice be framed into law? People of conscience, people of conscience appear. Rise up to reclaim the ballot box. Repay the deceitful, reject them and deny them office. Will a corrupt government stand? Will injustice? Justice be left unanswered. Rise up, you of faith, you of hope. Rise up to stand stalwart against threats to democracy. So I, I did like that for today. Um, okay, so then um, if there's no other business from Shira, I would love to introduce our guest, Jenna Brovsky. Right there, this lovely young lady who agreed to speak to us today. So, um, a little bit about Jenna's background and why, though, Shira, is it your picture instead? Of... Okay, I see what's going on. Okay. okay, I'll tell you a little bit about Jenna. So, uh, Jenna is originally from Long Island and she earned her JD with high honors from the George Washington University Law School and her BA cum laude from Brandeis. Presently, she is a senior associate in Hush Blackwell's Kansas City office. She is a member of the firm's Healthcare Education and Life Sciences Industry Group and its Labor and Employment Practice. She's an active alumna of Avodah, Jewish Service Corps for Young Adults, working to build the foundations for careers and lifelong activism in social and economic justice movements. She also serves as an elected member of of let's see, elected member of Ward 4 of the Fairway Kansas City Council. In August, she was named by Missouri Lawyers Media as a 2020 up and coming awardee. She's married to Ethan Corson, who is a candidate for the Kansas State Senate from District 7, and they have a one year old son, Isaac. So please welcome Jenna. Thank you, Gloria. Can everyone hear me? Some thumbs up. All right. Well, thank you so much for letting me crash the sisterhood luncheon. I know it's taboo to wear white after Labor Day, but I thought given the speech and the theme here, I could, I could pull it off. Um, as Gloria stated, I'm Jenna. And as you all know, we're 20 years past the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, um, which in very simple terms gave women the right to vote. But I think there are two caveats kind of to start off the discussion. First, of course, women of color couldn't vote um, in 1919, 1920. We had Jim Crow, we had a lot of other restrictions. And the second kind of caveat to start off is that the 19th Amendment gave the right to citizens in all states who were women to vote in national elections. But a lot of states already had given that right to women, including the one and only Kansas. So Kansas was the first state to recognize a women's right to vote in municipal elections in 1887, actually. Um, and then in 1912, um, more broadly than that. Um, about a quarter of the states had some permission, had granted some permission to women prior to the 19th Amendment being passed. So the focus is the 19th Amendment, but I kind of wanted to put it in context. And there's a lot of stuff out there this year and last year. And I imagine many of you have seen a lot more than I have um, on this topic. So I thought what would be most useful today was to pick out some highlights, um, look at the actual amendment, do some highlights, some things that I thought were a little interesting, maybe for this particular group, and then really think about the purpose of the 19th Amendment and whether that purpose has been met. Um, I have to give some credit to the American Bar Association because I was inspired by a presentation I went to there where they talked about gender parity. Um, and they, the thesis was that voting is important, but voting is not 
necessarily reflective of full engagement in the political process. The 19th Amendment wasn't just about getting women the right to vote, but it was to get them fully engaged in the political process. So uh, with that, I have a few slides of just some stuff to look at while I talk so you don't get bored of my face. Um, Shira, it looks like the host disabled participant screen sharing. sharing. Okay. See if it works now. We did it. Can you guys see see my first slide here? Cool. Okay. Um, here we go. So let's just look at the 19th Amendment a second. Um, so we don't forget the words, the rights of the citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. So everyone has the right to this particular to vote and sex shall not be considered. And I, to vote is really important, right? Because um, <laughs> that's the only right that the constitution guarantees expressly to women. Uh, the Equal Rights Amendment, and we'll get to that at the end, has not been added to the constitution. So this is, the right to vote is the only right that expressly includes women. And the second part of the 19th Amendment is that Congress will have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Um, and I think that's important too, um, because not only is this a right, um, oh, we're getting some chats here. Um, not only is this a right in the constitution, but Congress can then pass laws pursuant to it. And actually right around the same time um, that the, the amendment was ratified, Congress passed a law, um, where is it? There we go, public law 66259. Um, June 5th, 1920, actually before the last state ratified. And this law set up the Women's Bureau, which is an agency of the Department of Labor and which has the express purpose to formulate standards and policies to promote the welfare of wage earning women, improve working conditions, increase efficiency and advance opportunities for profitable employment. Um, and this was done in conjunction with the passage of the 19th Amendment. Um, I know this is kind of small to read, but I think it's important to point out that in this law, it was stated that this Women's Bureau had to be headed by a woman, that she had to receive a salary of $5,000 at that point in time. Um, and to note that this Bureau is still in effect today. Um, President Trump named the 19th director to the Women's Bureau. Um, she's a pretty good pick. Um, she was a teacher. She did policy work around education. Um, and really most of what the Women's Bureau is doing today is data tracking. Um, who's working and in what occupation? And kind of why is that important? Well, I don't have to tell you that for a long time, women were property, moved from their fathers to their husbands without any independence. And so working gave women independence, right? Exposure to things outside the family and thus the opportunity to form their own political opinions. I happened to meet my husband at a political um, inaugur presidential inauguration. So I don't really know what that's like to have a spouse with different, uh, different political views. But I think for many couples, that's the reality. And I would, I would say that's a pretty good thing. Um, so kind of stepping back, um, and I'm going to pass through this stuff really quickly, because I think you guys all know the, the gist of it. So the 19th Amendment passed the House in May, May 21st, 1919. And it passed the Senate on June 4th, 1919. And then the states start ratifying it. How does ratification work? Um, well, any amendment can come to the, before, uh, to the Constitution in two ways. It can come by Congress or it can come by a convention. And then either way, you need three quarters of the states to vote. And at the time in 1919, 1920, there were 48 states. So we only needed 36 states. Um, can you raise your hand if you know who the 36th state was? to ratify the Constitution or ratify the 19th Amendment? I don't see any hands raised. I see one hand, all right. Uh, I see Allison, I think it was Tennessee. Um, and actually, this is really interesting. I learned when I was doing some research. Um, so in Tennessee, um, the vote, it was gonna fail. The amendment wasn't gonna be ratified and uh, Harry Byrne was a 24 year old and 
he actually got on the state house floor and his mother urged him to vote in favor of it and he switched his vote and he did. Um, so to all those mothers out there, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, so like I said, the states start ratifying it. Um, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and every state kind of has their own process for doing this. In Kansas, the legislature called a session um, on June 16th, 1919. In Missouri, it was a month later in July and the governor um, called a special session. And I said that Kansas had given the right to vote to women before the 19th Amendment. Missouri, a few months earlier, had given the right to vote for president only to women. So a uh, few months before the 19th Amendment passed, women could vote for that one office. So like I said, Tennessee, 36th state, um, that's three quarters of 48. I did the math to double check on that one. Um, and then it's signed into law by Secretary of State um, Bainbridge Colby. Um, and there was no fanfare, uh, nothing, no photographs. And that was kind of bizarre even at that time. And uh, purportedly that was to avoid any kind of feuding or any bad press um, around the incident, but it's still kind of suspicious to me as to why there wasn't a lot of fanfare. So um, that's how we got the 19th Amendment, technically. Um, so I wanted to just look at something that the Women's Bureau put together. Um, so they, I just want to kind of show that since they've been tracking data, this is, this is today, this is, well, August 2020, it looks like women are participating equally in the labor force, um, a little less than men. Unemployment rates are about equal, um, but I think the Women's Bureau plays an important role, and that wouldn't have been formed if not uh, for the 19th Amendment. Um, let's see what else we got here. Right. So then... Another kind of useful, I, don't, I didn't put the slides up here, but there's something called the American Time Use Survey. And that's a survey that's done by the Department of Labor, measures how much time every day people spend on doing various activities. So sleeping, working, socializing. Um, and there's a category for organizational, civic, and religious activities. I thought that kind of combines a lot of things, but kind of the best um, proxy for what I think is political engagement. And for women um, under the age of 75, it's about a quarter of an hour each day. For women over 75, it's 0.6 a day. So women over the age of 75 are spending more time on organizational, civic, and religious activities. And compared to men, um, women are doing a lot more in that area. So men were spending between 0.17 and 0.3 hours a day. So that shows women are more engaged. And we'll talk about the lack of women actually holding elected office. Um, so perhaps women are doing more of the behind the scene work um, in terms of time spent that women are spending more time on a daily basis in, in this area. Okay. Um, oh, and then this is an interesting one too. Labor force participation by sex and parental status just kind of showing that um, men who are fathers are participating at 93.3% um, as opposed to women who are mothers at 71. 0.5% when we talk about barriers to women engaging in the political process to getting to the polls to vote to running for office. Um, uh, often that has to do with uh, not having child care um, and having other obligations. Okay. Okay, so let's let's go back in history here. Um, most folks are familiar with the first women's rights convention in Seneca Falls in who knows the answer? Raise your hand if you know what year that was held in. I should have prizes. I think people would raise their hands more. Um, 1848, um, it was a two day event. And um, the organizers originally weren't sure that men would show up and definitely didn't think that men wanted to speak. And so all these men came and they wanted to speak. So what did they do? Day one was only women, and then they let the men speak on the second day. Um, ultimately, there are 68 women, 32 men signed this Declaration of Sentiments, and I have it up on the screen here. And it sets 12 resolutions calling for equal treatment of women and men under the law. And it's really broad. It's not just about the right to vote. So I think this, um, these quotes are, I'm going to read them because I think they're important. The first one says, the history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of man toward woman, having indirect object, the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her, 
To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. Um, and then the second quote from this Declaration of Sentiments that I have here is now, in view of this entire disfranchisement of one half of the people of this country, their social and religious degradation, in view of the unjust laws above mentioned, and because women do feel themselves aggrieved, oppressed, and fraudulently deprived of their most sacred rights, we insist that they have immediate admission to all the rights and privileges which belong to them as citizens of the United States. Now, at this point in 1848, what were the rights that all citizens have? Um, it was not clearly defined. And we'll go through a really interesting case that came out of Missouri um, to talk about that. But this was the Declaration of Sentiments. And women in Missouri, even before that case, had been forming suffrage organizations uh, for a long time, since 1867. They tried 17 times to get a vote on suffrage. Um, eight times it came before the legislature of those 17, and of course they failed every time. And so then we get to 1869, and this is where it gets interesting. So there's a National Women's Suffrage Convention in St. Louis, and there are two sisters, Frances and Virginia, and they advance this theory that the 14th Amendment, the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, this is section one, there's four sections to the 14th Amendment, this already gives women the right to vote. Um, because of the Privileges and Immunities Clause, it's what it's called. And it's that second sentence, um, which says, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. So they said, well, we already have the right to vote. It's contained in there. Um, all you women show up at the polls and demand that you have the right to vote. So uh, Miss Virginia does that. She shows up and... Uh, they say, nope, no, you can't vote. So she says, well, I'm gonna bring a lawsuit. So she brings a lawsuit against, um, it's called Minor versus Happerset. Minor's her last name. Happerset is the registrar. At that time, the person who is responsible for registering voters um, to say that she's a citizen, she has the right, um, she has the right to vote. And the court in a unanimous decision says, nope, the constitution doesn't grant anyone the right to vote. Um, that was obviously changed with the 19th Amendment. Um, but the first thing the court says is women are citizens. Yes, that's true, because a citizen is basically anyone who resides in the United States at that time. Um, but a citizen is not the same as a voter. And that's fascinating to me because today, you know, if you talk to anyone who's going through naturalization proceedings, who's trying to be a citizen, one of the major perks is the ability to vote. But um, back before the 19th Amendment, um, and even kind of after voting was not synonymous with citizenship. So that was the case of minor versus Happerset. And the court, um, which it sometimes does, interestingly at the end said, we are not passing judgment on what should or should not be, whether, in other words, whether they should or should not vote. They say, if the law is wrong, it ought to be changed, but the power for that is not with us. So they really kick it to the legislature and say, you know, if you think that Women should have the right to vote. Do you know you need to pass a law to do that? Um, and the court also said that the right to vote was not part of citizenship because prior to the 19th Amendment, we had the 15th Amendment. And raise your hand if you know what the 15th Amendment did. It relates to voting. I think I see one hand. Uh, it gave the right to vote regardless of race. Um, and so the rationale was why would we need the 15th Amendment if? all citizens already had the right to vote. Um, why would we need to have passed the 15th Amendment? So that argument, this novel theory was shut down um, and we'd have to wait until 1919 to see the, uh, 1920 to see the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Um, I put this picture up too, because it was Missouri related, um, but in 1916, so it was just a few years uh, before the ratification of the 19th Amendment, at the DNC convention in St. Louis, there was the Golden Lane protest, um, which is pretty cool. So women come out um, and they're silent. They're totally silent and they parade down and it's meant to illustrate that women have been silenced and they've not been allowed to vote. Um, and that ultimately led to that, like I talked about earlier, the right for women to vote for president in Missouri in March, 1919, just shortly before the 19th Amendment was ratified. Okay, so that's kind of the Missouri side of things. The Kansas side of things, we're gonna jump, jump across state line road here. So Kansas is a 
really progressive history, um, particularly in, in the suffrage and abolitionist context. Um, like I said, Kansas was the first state to hold a direct vote on women's suffrage in 1867. And then it recognized a woman's right to vote in local or municipal elections in 1887. And the town of Argonia, Kansas elected the first women ma woman mayor in the United States. Her name is Susanna Salter. And I looked it up, Argonia, Kansas is South Central Kansas, just west of Wichita. Her home is still a national historic site um, if you wanna go visit it today. And I thought the funniest thing about her was that she didn't realize her name was on the ballot until the morning of the election. I thought that was pretty funny. And she became involved, like many of these suffragettes, through religion. So she came about through the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Um, and that's kind of a theme of the women's of suffrage was how religion played a role. So you saw the Quaker women in Seneca Falls. So of course, you know, I started thinking about the Jewish faith and some of you might have looked into this, but something interesting I came across was this feud uh, between two rabbis in New York. Um, Rabbi Weiss and Rabbi Silverman. Um, nod your head if, you, if you've heard of this feud before. Okay, maybe I, maybe I got something new for folks. Um, so yeah, so they were both reform rabbis um, and Rabbi Weiss was a strong advocate of suffrage and Rabbi Silverman was not and they'd fight from the pulpit and they'd have competing speeches. Um, you can read all about it. The New York Times at that time would publish their speeches back and forth. Um, and to me, I was like, well, of course, this is Jews would be in favor of women's suffrage, but it really wasn't, it really wasn't that simple. And it kind of went back to, um, kind of went back to the idea of what's a woman's role. And so if you start looking at um, like rabbis and writings from that time, it's really split. Um, there's some famous rabbis in Israel as well, who wrote back and forth about what's the halachic case for having um, women's, women's suffrage, women elected to office. Um, and I thought the funniest one I found, um, I was gonna read from it, was uh, Rabbi Ben-Zion Uzekiel. So I think he was in the chief Sephardic rabbi of Jaffa. And he was saying, you know, okay, so the, the Torah says women should be, the Torah says all these things about women. Women are flighty is one example. Um, and he says, well, you know, if the rationale is flighty, people shouldn't vote. There are a lot of men who are flighty. And he kind of uses that same, the same thought to say, anytime, you know, they say a woman, a woman is this or a woman is that, well, there's plenty of, plenty of men too. You know, if the rationale is peace in the home, uh, we don't want women having their own opinions, well, then we shouldn't let children vote because that would cause unrest in the home. So from what I found, at least, the Jewish community was pretty split, at least the rabbis who were writing about this, probably not the people on the ground so much, um, about whether suffrage made sense, at least at the time, um, at least at the time of the 1919 and 1920. So going back to Kansas, uh, Kansas in 1912, as I said, recognized the right of women to vote. Um, and so I did some reading about the campaign in 1912 how did they get the word out to organize? Um, and I thought it was interesting because right now we're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, people aren't going out very much. We're doing everything virtually like this meeting. Um, in 1912, they said the reason that um, suffrage passed was because automobiles had just come out and people could ride in automobiles and go door to door, really farm to farm and tell people, um, hey, this is this really exciting idea. You should vote for it. Um, there are all, all kinds of creative ways to get get out the vote. Uh, there were plays that were written. There was like an essay contest in a school um, and things that we can definitely maybe learn from today. So, and then to kind of close out the highlights of Kansas, skipping ahead, um, another piece of trivia for you, Kansas uh, is the only state in the country that's elected three women governors, Joan Finney, Kathleen Sebelius, and Laura Kelly. So that's a little bit, a little bit on the Kansas Jewish side of things. What I'm really excited to talk with you about is kind of where we are today. Like, has the amendment met its purpose? So these are graphs from the U.S. Census Bureau, um, and they talk about female registration and female turnout in elections since the 1980s, since the 1980 election, really. And as you can see, female registration and female turnout have both been higher than men. More women actually have cast their vote since the 1980 election than men. 
In 2018, 55% of eligible women voted versus 51.8% of men. And kind of put it in that in context, in 1964, 34% of women uh, eligible, registered eligible women uh, voted and 37.5% of men. So now we're at 55% of eligible women and 51.8% of eligible men. And this is not partisan, but to also kind of see where the trends are, so President Trump won by 52% of votes cast by men, but only 41% of votes cast by women. And there was a recent study by the Pew Center of registered voters that said that Joe Biden was leading President Trump by two percentage points among men, but 14 percentage points among women. And so you kind of see where the preferences are generally. Um, the gender gap in party affiliation is also pretty broad. So 56% of female registered voters identified as Democrats or leaned Democrats. 38% of female registered voters identified as Republican. Um, and if you look at the men, 50% uh, of men registered, male registered voters um, identified as Republican and 42% identified as Democratic. And the, that gap has really been growing even wider since 2014. So women are voting in equal numbers or higher actually than men, but, but, but the voting rate itself is abysmal. So in the last federal presidential election in 2018, um, the estimates of who voted was between 56 and 61% of registered voters. 51 and 61, 56 and 61%, excuse me, of registered voters. So that means that almost half the eligible voters did not vote in a presidential election. And that's a presidential election. We're not talking about local elections or primaries. There are elections every year that I think folks, I'm sure nobody on this phone call, but other folks seem to forget. So when I ran for city council last year in 2019, it was an odd year. Um, not odd as in strange, but odd as in numerically, it was not, uh, it was 2019. So there were no statewide elections. 17.35% of folks voted. So there is the, the numbers in Johnson County. So now let's kind of zoom in here. 17.35% of registered voters voted in the November 5th, 2019 election. Um, if you look at the, the that's the first graphic um, on my left. Uh, the second graphic is for the primary that just happened earlier this year. Um, and you'll see the voter turnout was 36, oh, 36%. So that's, that's pretty low. So I won my race by 142 votes. There are primaries that are won by five votes. Um, Hadassah Magazine actually had this great write-up at the end of last year about female legislators. My mother brought me a copy last time I saw her. And it uh, talks about uh, Representative Eileen Filler-Korn, who if you haven't heard of her, she's a Jewish legislator in Virginia, the first woman to ever lead a party in the Virginia House of Delegates. And she talks about being inspired by Tikkun Olam. She's very cool. She won her first race by 37 votes. So the summary there is your vote really does matter, particularly in the lower, or not lower, but the local down ballot races. So that kind of gets us, okay, so women are kind of voting in equal numbers to men, um, but nobody's really voting. And um, that's just voting. So let's talk about kind of participation in politics beyond that. These are some slides I, I stole from the American Bar Association. Um, women are 50.97% of the population and 24.4% uh, of Congress. So there are 132 women in Congress. That's including the non-voting delegates, uh, meaning, for example, Washington DC does not have any voting uh, representatives, but Eleanor Norton Holmes represents District of Columbia. Uh, American Samoa, Puerto Rico, there are several other entities that are part of the United States. Um, and actually, interestingly, they're all, uh, all the represent, all the non-voting delegates are women. So if we throw them in, which I think it's fair to do, there's 132 women um, in Congress. 106 are in the House um, and uh, 26 are in the Senate. And that's 20, again, that's 24.4% um, of Congress. And if you do it by party, 108 are in the Democratic Party and um, 
23 are Republican. And also when I was kind of looking into this, the first actual, the first woman to be elected to the House of Representatives happened to be before the 19th Amendment uh, was ratified. It was in 1916, Jeanette Rankin of Montana. And she famously said, I may be the first woman member of Congress, but I won't be the last. And she was right. Um, so that's Congress. And if we kind of break it down to women in elected office statewide, um, as you can see the numbers, these numbers are a little lower for Congress because it's not including the non-voting delegates. Um, but if you go to statewide elected office, 29% are women. Um, so that would be positions like Secretary of State, Lieutenant Governor across the country. And then for the state legislature, 28.9% uh, of state legislators are women. In 2018, it was estimated that there were 230 Jewish state legislators and 82 of those 230 are women. I did the math again, that's 35% of Jewish state legislators are women. So it's higher than the number of women who are generally state legislators, but still significantly lower than our population, which is over, our percentage of the population, which is over half. Okay, um, so, so I talked about being elected to office, but I think that's only one part of full participation in the, in the political process. So I think it's important to see who's running the campaign. So there was a survey done in August 2019. For the first time, um, women made up more than half the senior staff on the campaigns of all the top polling candidates. So 2019, we saw a ton of folks running in the Democratic primary for president. So it was kind of a good case study to see where women were. So there were, basically there were 53 individuals um, who were central to the campaigns of the top polling um, the top polling women, and of those, 31 were women. So 60% of the senior staff of the top polling candidates were female, which is, I think, pretty amazing. Um, the less good news was that when you came, to, when you looked at just the kind of position of campaign manager, which is the top of the top, um, women were nearly shut out. Out. There was like one at the time that the study was done, um, which was Tulsi Gabbard, and her sister was in that position and she wasn't receiving salary. So it's unclear if we should really count that. But summary is that more women are involved in leadership roles on presidential campaigns. So kind of the last topic I wanted to get to was what are some of the barriers to women running for office? Um, because I think that goes to the full political participation. Um, and one of those relates to child care. Um, recently, or a few years ago, uh, there was a woman running for Congress, Yuba Shirley, Gretchen Shirley in New York, and she wanted to use campaign funds for child care so that she could have a babysitter so she could attend meetings and she could go out and door knock. Seems to make sense to me. Uh, hadn't been done before, um, but she petitioned the Federal Election Commission and she was successful. And um, so now on the federal level, women can use uh, campaign dollars for child care so that they can go about running for office. And similarly in Kansas, uh, Representative Eileen Horn got a similar opinion from the Kansas Governmental Ethics Commission. So that's one barrier that we're kind of chipping away at. There are a lot of barriers we can certainly talk about for voting for, for all folks. Um, and there certainly is sexism that I have seen in kind of the research and not so much um, overt sexism, but kind of behind the scenes way that women have been treated that we can certainly talk more about in my own race. Um, I never experienced anything quite like that, although I did get a, how do you have time for that? Uh, often, you know, how could you have time for that? You have a child. And I think the proper response is, um, would you ever ask a man that question? That's the type of sexism that I think we still see in prevents a lot of women um, from kind of stepping up when they're in a similar position. So I might have gone a little bit over the time here, but hopefully you learned a little something and I'm interested to hear people's thoughts if they have things that they wanna share or other barriers, um, the kind of unfinished business. And, and we didn't talk about the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, I apologize for that as folks, folks all know, um, so the, the status of that is it's passed the, the House of Representatives earlier this year um, passed, um, passed a bill that says that the, de the deadline for ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment should be extended 
it's not really going to get brought up to a vote in the Senate based on Senate leadership. It's pretty much dead. Um, even Ruth Bader Ginsburg um, has said, let's start again. So I, I, don't, I don't mean to be dismissive or pessimistic about that. I'm not sure that there's a lot of excitement around that right now. And I'm kind of curious what folks of a different generation are feeling um, about that as well. So thank you. Thank you for your time. And uh, that, that's it. <laughs> that's all I got. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Sure. Hi, Blanche. Go ahead. I, I'm just overwhelmed by the wealth of information <laughs> you shared with us. It was just outstanding. Do you have notes that you could, um, that your statistics were mind boggling. Mm -hmm. um, do you have notes that you could just um, maybe attach to an email that we could? Absolutely. Oh, that would be wonderful. Thank Happy you. So, I mean, I know that that took research and you probably enjoyed doing I, it. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I could tell. But, um, it was just most interesting. And I'm glad. I learned a lot about Kansas. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew that the first mayor in the United States? First female mayor. Yeah, I'm, I told Ethan we need to make a trip to Argonia, Kansas after the pandemic. I'll let you know when we're going, if you want to come. Okay. But if whatever attachment you could send mm -hmm. to an email, I'd really, really appreciate it. Absolutely. Jenna, I have a question. Um, this is Tensi Marcus Botker. I recently read a book called uh, Somebody's Got to Do It by um, a she's a professor in the East Coast who decided to run for a local city uh, county position, it's somewhat similar to what you have. But I think one of the main barriers that she encountered was that most of the, this, she ran for a position on a 14 member board. It's a very funny book actually. She, she was very angry after the 2016 election and decided somebody asked her to run and she went ahead and did it. Um, but the biggest issue was that most of the people on the board were either retirees or um, uh, pretty much that was it. The only women were the ones that were stay-at-home moms. I think another issue with electoral office, and I think the, the first step for women is to start at the local level, is the economic one. It's almost impossible to attend the meetings you have to attend, the, the, you know, the responsiveness you have to give at local meetings to the public. So can you talk to that, how, how that affects the city council that you're in at Fairway? Or? Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, city councils were not built for the working woman or the working parents, um, for sure. In Fairway, we meet early in the morning or late at night. Uh, so not that early, 7.30 to 9, um, or we meet uh, in the evenings at 7.30. Um, I think that the more women who are on these um, on these boards, the more they'll realize the things that women need. Um, so, I mean, for example, it wasn't until two years ago that there was a lactation room in the state, in the Kansas house, um, because there hadn't been any women who were breastfeeding and nursing. So again, I think it was just helping to realize the things that women need, but we can't do that until there are more women in there. Um, and it is hard to be the first one to, to pave the way. Um, I think that at, not so much at the city council, but more on the state legislative level, uh, the fact that pay is pretty low um, is also a barrier um, for women who want to, you know, to take a job where you work half the year and make a salary that's below the federal poverty level is not really um, that appealing to most folks. Um, so that that is certainly a barrier. Yeah, I would agree with that. I'm going to have to have to look that book up because it sounds like a good one. Any other questions? This was great, Jenna. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your wealth of information. And I hope everyone will vote. And I also hope anyone in 
Ethan Corson's <laughs> district support him. He's running for uh, Barbara Bullier's place. Is that right? Yeah. Yes, yes. She's running for the U.S. Senate, and he's running to fill that seat. Right. So this is wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope everyone who joined us from Sisterhood um, appreciated Jenna's efforts and um, that we will have good representation and a good outcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you. ladies, for coming. We appreciate it. Thank you. And hope you enjoyed it. Great job, Jenna yeah. and Gloria. <laughs> It's Thanks, Aunt pleasure, <laughs> the pleasure of the program committee. I didn't do it alone. It happened to be that I made the contact because I knew Jenna. But uh, the programs for Sisterhood are the efforts of our committee of three and our wonderful president, Shira. So all year, we hope we will bring you things that you will want to attend. And um, I was disappointed it was virtual. But to be honest, um, I'm OK with this. So, <laughs> so keep, keep supporting us. And if you have program ideas, please let us know. So, Very thank nice. you, everybody. Very good. Thank Very you. Good. Thank you. Thanks so much. Good job, Gloria. Thanks, Gloria. You all. Thank you. Our pleasure.